Oh, hello there, good sir. I've heard you've requested to hear some stories from the 19th century and Victorian era. Well, you've come to the right place, old chap. Take a seat, pour yourself some wine or whiskey and relax. Allow me to tell you some frightening stories from the 19th century and Victorian era. And yes, this will be the gimmick for the entire video. So let's try this one on for size. The year was 1862, and there was panic around the streets of London. There was a gang of violent criminals who went around the old smoke, garrotting unsuspecting civilians. Anyone caught in their path was due a wire around their tender neck, soon to be choked out by these villains. One such case was a member of our parliament, James Pilkington. Some say that he was walking home from Westminster on the 17th of July, when he was attacked from behind by two ruffians, and in a brutal display of power, let's just say that he was relieved of his duties as a public servant. At least that was the story published in Jan Bondenson's book, The London Monster. For this reason, London locals were absolutely terrified. At the time, it was said that many of London's prisons were overcrowded, and many of its inhabitants were being set free to once again walk the streets. Now, many in the modern day might believe that this gang of garrotters never actually existed. But if you were to take things back to the early to mid 1860s, the people of London would have laughed you silly, of course there was. This mass hysteria even led to the 1863 Garrotters Act, which reintroduced corporal punishment for those found of armed or violent robbery. Therefore, those men would think twice about their crimes before they did them. Many a town folk boarded themselves up in their homes for fear that London would soon be taken over by a multitude of stabbers, hackers, garrotters, and repulsive rotters. But in fairness, Perhaps that fear was a bit misguided, because it hasn't. Well, not yet, anyways. But the way things are going in London right now, I would keep those wooden planks and nails at the ready. Well, that was a splendid story, and so is the next. This is the legend of the Black Swine of Hampstead. We'll have to take things back even further for this next one. It was near the end of the 1850s when our next story takes place. A story that tells the tale that in the sewers of London lived a large number of swine. But not just any swine old chum, these pigs were, at least according to legend, monstrous. And many people thought that one day they'd be free of their putrid home and run amok along Hampstead and eventually the rest of London. Not a soul knows for sure how this urban legend began all those years ago, but many believe that one day someone put a pregnant sow down in the sewers. And good sir, I'm not sure if you're privy to the information, but London sewers did have a reputation for being horribly filthy at the time, and therefore the swine was able to sustain itself on the wasted food and other wastes of sort. From there, it gave birth and several generations of inbreeding ensued. And now we have hundreds, if not thousands of terribly inbred pigs down in the sewers, under our very feet. The story was even published in the respected newspaper, The Daily Telegraph, back in 1859, adding legitimacy to the tale in the eyes of the locals. With that being said though, unless they've been there for many years more, these swine have not yet emerged. Time will only tell if they ever do. We have to be a bit more general for this next story, but I must say that one of the best inventions made in recent years has been the photographic camera. Being able to capture exactly what you're looking at. Why, what an indeed a brilliant invention. However, many people years ago said they had been seeing spectres within their photographs. A peculiar sight, indubitably, especially because none of these people remember inviting these poltergeists to pose for a picture with them. Very strange indeed. Now, I believe I heard that it was William Mulmer, who was the first photographer who was able to contact the spirit realm through his work, producing this image back in 1869. We all know that Mr. Lincoln passed in 1865, but his wife Mary Todd Lincoln was then said to have come in to get her picture taken. Now, Mr. Mulmer claims that he did not know that his sitter was Mary Todd Lincoln, with him saying that she gave him the name Mrs. Tundle and him only seeing the ghost of Mr. Lincoln after the photograph was developed. But this does not excuse the fact that Mr. Mulmer must have had a deep connection with the spirit world, because he was able to get a lot of ghosts within his photography. Like this picture with John J. Glover, with an old woman's spectre. A Mrs. French is sat here with the vision of her son, or perhaps a small child. Moses A. Zhao featured here with his assistant, or former assistant, I suppose or Fanny Content, whose late brother decided to share this moment with her from the next life. Once again, I must repeat myself, very strange indeed. 
Now, I could not talk about Victorian legends without mentioning the infamous spring Hill Jack. This man terrorised Londoners, Scots and those from the Midlands for years, with his enigmatic character and police dodging temperament. Everyone was afraid of him, even yours truly, because the stories I have heard of him said that he could jump far distances, much farther than your average man. And while this tall, bony, devil-like man would greet you with charm and class upon meeting you, this would merely be a facade, because his true colours would soon show. His true intentions would soon come to fruition, and if you're caught within this range, there is no escaping unharmed. Reports at the time claimed that he could breathe out white and blue flames, like a horrid dragon. And perhaps even more scary, some claimed that he wore sharp, metallic claws on his fingertips. I heard that the first report of this fiend was documented back in 1837, the same year the Queen Victoria, may she rest in peace, took the throne. The tale in this first instance of his sighting goes that there was this young girl, Mary Stevens was her name, she was walking to Lavender Hill after finishing her job working as a servant in Battersea. On her way to Clapham Common, a strange figure leapt out at her from a dark alley, immobilising her with a dominant grip of her arms, placing his lips upon her face in a sickening fashion, while ripping her clothes off with his ghastly claws, which were, according to her deposition, cold and clammy as those of a corpse. In a panic, the girl screamed her lungs off, and fortunately, this was enough to persuade the attacker to quickly flee from the scene. The commotion brought several residents who immediately launched a search for the aggressor, but he could not be found. The next day though, it's said that a similar sequence of events took place, but this time, witnesses say they saw him escape by jumping over a nine foot high wall, while cackling with a high pitched, ringing laughter. This would be where he gets his name from, because it was like there were springs in his heels he could jump so high. The monster would later go on to attack several others, such as Jane Alsop and Lucy Scales, but this ghoulish man was never caught. By the 1870s, his attacks became less and less frequent, but the man known as the Terror of London would become a boogeyman-like character for us Brits. Whoever he was, what he wanted, where he came from, why he did it, and how he got his strange powers, this is a mystery that eludes even the greatest minds of Scotland Yard to this very day, many years later. Now, if you go just north of London, you might stumble across Epping Forest, and if you go inside, you might happen to find this pond here. But if you do, it's important to get out of there as soon as possible, because if you don't, you will be in grave danger. The origins of this cursed location date back a few years now, to 1887. There was a young servant girl, her name was Emma Morgan. She was a new mother, having recently given birth. In what should have been one of the most exciting parts of her life, it's said a strange supernatural force came over the poor girl, and she was given no options. Whether it be by her own mind or the supernatural beings that surround the area, she was forced to walk into this pond, killing her and her newborn babe. It's said that the pool was cursed from an event that happened a few hundred years ago, when a young couple met there. The couple were never meant to be, not according to the young girl's father, who disapproved of their relationship. He killed the girl in a fit of anger and rage. Her boyfriend, the young man, then took his own life upon discovering her deceased corpse at the location they promised to meet, with the two now being together forever, but unknowingly cursing the pond evermore. After this first initial instance of the mother and her newborn dying there, as the years went by, many others that were wandering around the forest would soon never be seen again. Each of their deaths were reported as suicides, despite their families each saying that their desires were never as such. Clearly, a force that's beyond our comprehension took control of their minds, with humans and animals alike being slaves to this being. And the strangest part of this all is that nobody knows for certain where this mysterious location resides. It might be best not to look for it though, because surely you'd never want to become yet another victim of it. For this reason, it might be best to avoid Epping Forest for your morning walks altogether. Looking back at some of these ghoulish characters from back in the day, we're reminded that not all of them were from Great Britain. Some of them were from other countries in our empire. For example, the Bunyip, which comes from the Aboriginal people of Australia. 
Of course, this creature was first documented a couple of hundred years ago, but really it got very popular indeed throughout the 1800s. If you don't think that this creature is terrifying, allow me to remind you that its name, the Bunyip, actually translates to devil or evil spirit. Though its name does vary on occasion according to tribal nomenclature. So how would you know if you spotted a Bunyip in Australia? Well, to identify it, there are several different physical characteristics which might act as a giveaway. Well, firstly, this beast is amphibious, being thought to be almost entirely aquatic, and inhabiting swamps, ponds, marshes, lagoons, creeks, waterholes, and the rest. If you're far away from any body of water, and you see a creature that you've never seen before, the chances are that it is not the deadly bunyip. If you're west of Melbourne, though, near Fiery Creek, I would be worried, however, because this was where the first death of a man at the hands of the creature would take place. Well, at least according to the Australasian, which reported in 1851 that this demon had killed an Aboriginal man. Over the next few years, many people would claim to see the creature, most of which described it as a seal-looking or perhaps a swimming dog-like creature, with a few others classifying it as a long neck being with a small head. Whatever the case, it's unfortunate that none of the locals were able to obtain a photograph of this monster but there have been several drawn sketches of the being. We have a few more rough descriptions of the bunyip to go off of, mainly that it's roughly four to six feet long, wears shaggy black or brown fur on its back, and is indeed nocturnal. As well as this, our Aboriginal friends have claimed that it lays its eggs within platypus nests, and while it often feeds on crayfish, it does indeed have a lust for human blood first and foremost. Fortunately for us though, as time went by and the 19th century drew to a close, so did the sightings of this evil creature. And so the people of Australia can sleep soundly at night once more. Whilst we're down in Oceania, I think it fitting to talk about the Fiji mermaid whose discovery shocked the world. It was brought to popularity by famous showman P.T. Barnum, best known for founding Barnum and Bailey Circus back in 1871. Years before this though, in 1842, he presented this creature to Barnum's American Museum in New York. It was the mummified body of a creature that was supposedly half mammal, half fish, a version of a mermaid. Barnum, in his autobiography, described the mermaid as an ugly, dried up, black looking, diminutive specimen about three feet long. Its mouth was open, its tail turned over, and its arms thrown up, giving it the appearance of having died in great agony. A significant departure from traditional depictions of mermaids as attractive creatures. Barnum printed off leaflets by the thousands to advertise this creature that he had apparently extensively studied, or at least studied enough to know about its background and history. I myself was never able to get a good glance at the creature, for as soon as it was introduced to the public, it was soon taken away, never to be seen again. Many people believe that it was destroyed in a fire, but others aren't so convinced. Some are neither convinced that this was even an authentic mermaid. They claim that it's preposterous that this man were to have captured the corpse of such a creature, and they say that P.T. Barnum did something as monstrous as sew the upper body of a juvenile monkey to the bottom half of a large fish to create this hoax for the public and earn substantial revenue from it. If true, Barnum would have been a villain of his time, but regardless, I would have loved to have seen this. Creature or creation, whichever it was. And of course, Barnum took this Fiji mermaid to the United States. So whilst we're there, why don't we talk about some regional horror stories from the 19th century? My friend from over in the south of the United States told me shortly before of some folklore coming from the state of Tennessee. If my memory serves me correctly, he called it the Bell Witch Haunting, and this story takes place between 1817 and 1821. There was a man by the name of John Bell Sr., who lived in Robinson County with his family, near the modest town of Adams. The legend my friend told me was that throughout the four years between 1817 and 21, his family and the local area came under attack by a mostly invisible entity that was able to speak, affect the physical environment, and shapeshift. Some accounts record this spirit to have also have been clairvoyant, and capable of crossing long distances with superhuman speed. 
these events would be documented by Martin V. Ingram many years later in 1894. And his accounts are where in the modern day we have most of our information of these events. He published to the world that the poltergeist's name was Kate, after the entity claimed at one point to be Old Kate Bat's Witch, and continued to respond favourably to the name. Its activity centred on John Bell's youngest daughter, Betsy, as well as John himself. The spirit eventually formed a relationship with the family, and gave various contradicting accounts of why it was there. Though something must have happened between the living and the dead, because this spirit would soon reveal its intentions to John that it was going to kill him, and it soon would by a poison. After this, Betsy would call off her engagement from her fiancé, and the entity declared that it would now leave the family alone. Throughout the rest of the 1800s, people did their best to try and piece together this mystery, but for one reason or another, none was able to give an answer for certain. And therefore, where this apparition came from, why it was targeting this family, with John and Betsy in particular, and where it is now, these are all mysteries that cannot be answered. Two and a half hours down from Adams, Tennessee, if you're travelling south, you might end up in Alabama. Or in particular, Maple Hill Cemetery, which is the focus of our next story, built in 1822. Now, I don't have to remind you that America's Civil War occurred in 1861 and lasted until 1865. And during this time, many a soldier, both Confederate and Union, were buried at this place. But if you go there to see the graves, you might notice something peculiar, to say the least. And that's a swing set and slide. Do you see, this place is known as the Dead Children's Playground due to the many children's spectres that people have claimed to encounter at this graveyard. Some more background on how it got its name was that it was the burial site of many children that passed after the Spanish flu ravaged the United States following the Great War. And so many people believe that this is where these children's souls reside, still not done yet playing with the equipment. Some even say that late at night, if you were to go to the cemetery after dark, between the hours of 10pm and 3am, you might be able to spot the spirits still swinging on the swings and enjoying the childhood that the Great War and the Spanish flu robbed them of. To this very day, many people say that there's just an aura to the location, that it feels extremely cursed and paranormal. Going much further out west now, allow me to tell you the story of Turnbull Canyon, located in California. It's a four mile loop trail and come the mid 1800s was the subject of many a ghost story. Some perhaps true, some perhaps not. One such story can be dated all the way back to the 1840s, and with much of America's land, this was taken from the native people of the area. Apparently, the natives weren't so fond of the Americans taking this canyon in particular, and therefore, many eventual spirits reside within the canyon. Or, as the tale goes. Take things to 1845, and the Mexican-American War will shortly begin. A man of the name William Workman became the captain of a group of Europeans and Americans, and following victorious battles, Mr. Workman was granted 49,000 acres of land, including with it, Turnbull Canyon. The only thing was that this land was still being inhabited by the Gabrielino natives, and Workman did not get on very well with them. And this was after many were slain at the hands of several Spanish conquistadors years prior. Many of the deceased were trying to protect their wives and children. This new chapter of their lives gave them all the more reason to turn to the supernatural for an equaliser. For this reason, it's said that the spirits of the Gabrielinos haunt the canyon, angry and willing to chase out anyone who enters it. The sound of yelling and the beat of drums have also been reported. Many years later, the land was sold to a Robert Turnbull, which is now where it gets its name from. Though it wouldn't be his for very long because he would sell it in 1887 and a few months later was mysteriously murdered while drunk. His murder has never been solved to this very day, but that's not where the supernatural ends when it comes to Turnbull Canyon. The supernatural spirits are questioned to be the culprit of his murder, but that's not even to mention the tales of cults that meet their skeletons of unbaptized infants and many, many more though many do doubt the legitimacy of these claims. Still, many people believe that abnormal goings-on occur frequently there. So we're taking things back to bloody old England for our next story, and this one actually set a legal precedent, believe it or not. 
So, the Hammersmith ghost murder case took place in the latter months of 1803, when the people local to Hammersmith in West London insisted that there was a ghostly spectre travelling around the local area. Many of these people believed that the ghost was of a suicide victim, though none could be sure of this fact. But after months of people claiming these sightings, things would soon take a deadly turn. This was as a 29 year old by the name Francis Smith, a member of an armed patrol set up in the wake of these reports, shot and killed a bricklayer, Thomas Millwood, with a shotgun shell to the lower jaw, after mistaking the white clothes of Millwood's trade for a ghostly apparition. Smith was found guilty of murder and sentenced to death, though his sentence was reduced to one year's hard labour. Now, as I said, this case would soon set a legal precedent because of what would happen next. What happened was that Millwood's wife had told the court that she had previously insisted that Thomas should wear a grey overcoat over his body, as he had already been mistaken for a ghost once before. Millwood's sister, who witnessed the incident, declared that Smith told Millwood to stop, and though Millwood did not, Smith fired almost immediately, not giving him enough time. Smith's intent was not self-defence, nor had he been provoked, nor did he intend to apprehend the being, but he did not intend to kill Mr Millwood. The jury came back to say that this was a case of manslaughter, but when the judge ordered that they pick a side, convict or acquit, they responded after deliberation that Smith should be convicted of murder and therefore given the customary sentence of being put to death. As I said before, and as you know, this would not happen and he was eventually given a lighter sentence. Eventually, the true culprit of the ghost, an elderly shoemaker named John Graham, came forward to confirm that it was indeed him that put the white sheet on to act like a spectre. After his apprentice kept scaring his children with ghost stories, he wanted to take a bit of revenge. John, if you ever watch this video, I must say that I apologise for scaring your children, but I only did it because I wanted a raise. I'll be testifying at your trial, good sir. Right, yeah then lads and lasses, that's it for me. Thank you very much for watching this video, and if you enjoyed, please make sure to like and subscribe. I was experimenting with something really new here, so I hope that you liked it. Apart from that, I have a bunch of socials in the description. Please make sure to go follow me on all of them. And with that aside, please let me know down in the comments what you'd like to see me do next, because I'm only 125 videos in, and I'm already out of ideas. Thank you for watching.